On a sunny winter afternoon, the pilots of a newly purchased A320 live through dreadful moments as the new airplane refuses to take off from the departure runway. Eventually the plane makes it into the air, but both engines fail just minutes after becoming airborne. Airplane accidents are rarely just due to a single cause, and believe me, this accident will show you how many unlikely things can go wrong on a single flight. Let's get into it. Welcome to airspace. On February 28, 2018, the pilots of a Smartlynx A320 prepared for departure from Tallinn, Estonia. I bet you have never heard of Smartlynx before. I sure had not before hearing about this accident. They are a small charter airline operating out of Estonia that's located in Eastern Europe. Their fleet consists of 18 Airbus A320 and 321 aircraft. On this snowy February day, it was a big day for four student pilots. They had successfully completed their simulator trainings and were now due for their base training day. A highly anticipated event in every pilot's career. After months and years of training, the base training is the first time the students actually get to fly the real aircraft. Every student gets to fly the plane without passengers and does six landings and one go around to get the feeling for the real aircraft. To teach and evaluate the new students, they were joined by an instructor captain seated in the left seat and a safety pilot and an inspector of the National Aviation Authority behind them. After the successful completion of this day's training, the student pilots would finally be able to fly the real routes, carrying passengers while being evaluated for further three months of their first duties. In the later morning hours, the first student took to the skies, under close scrutiny by the instructor, the safety pilot and the inspector of the Civil Aviation Authority. Everything was fine until the plane leveled off to circle around the airport and prepare for landing. At this time, the plane's monitoring systems alerted the crew of a fault of one of the flight control computers. ELAC-1 pitch fault. The ELAC is one of two elevator and aileron computers that, as the name states, controls the elevators and ailerons of the plane. It also moves the horizontal tailplane to trim the aircraft. No checklist actions were associated with the warning, so the crew evaluated the failure and decided to reset the computer. After that, the warning disappeared and the student pilot was cleared for his very first real landing. After touchdown, a touch and go was performed. That means that the thrust levers were immediately readvanced after touchdown and the momentum and speed of the plane was used to take off again just seconds later. All went well again until the plane leveled off. This time, the crew received an ELAC-2 pitch fault alert. Again, they performed a computer reset and all was well after that. Training continued like this for hours, with alternating ELAC-1 and ELAC-2 faults after every level off. Finally, it was the fourth student's turn. The same sequence of ELAC-1 and ELAC-2 faults continued to happen, but during the third touch and go, things suddenly started to go terribly wrong. After the landing, the student pilot advanced the thrust levers to full power, the plane sped up and when it reached takeoff speed, the instructor called rotate to tell the student that it was time to take off again. The student pulled back on the side stick, but nothing happened. The instructor insisted rotate, rotate, but whatever the student tried, the plane would not fly. With presence of mind, the instructor pilot took control and pulled back on his side stick, but nothing happened. I can only imagine how the pilots must have felt at that time, while hurtling towards the runway end at a higher speed in a plane that would not fly. Adding insult to injury, a warning appeared that stated left and right elevator fault, implying that whatever their attempts would be, the elevators would not respond and the plane would not fly. At this speed, the takeoff rejection should no longer happen, according to Airbus flight manuals. Now, due to the high speed the plane attained, it generated so much lift that it took off without input from the elevators and climbed to an altitude of just 19 feet or 6 meters. The captain, baffled, now reduced power, ordered the landing gear to be retracted and reduced the flaps by one step. These actions seem unreasonable to me, but this is what he did at that moment. This led to the plane rapidly sinking back to the runway below, while the landing gear was still in transit. The A320 hit the runway hard, nose wheel first, then with its belly and engines and bounced back into the air. The captain now applied full power and the plane assumed an attitude of 9 degrees nose up and started climbing at a whopping 6000 feet per minute. This airport surveillance camera captured the impact and bounce. Soon the aircraft's pitch attitude reached almost 20 degrees and several warnings blared through the cockpit. The flaps were locked in position, all elevators had failed and engine 2 was on fire due to the impact with the runway. 
Now, finally, one of the pilots, the safety pilot on the rear seat, realized what was happening and called out the sentence written in bold red letters on the pilot's flight displays, manual pitch trim only. Every Airbus pilot knows this state exists, but hopes never to face it. In that state, somehow all control of the elevators is lost, despite four separate computers and three separate hydraulic systems controlling them. Airbus writes in their manuals that whoever is so unlucky to ever see this message should only see it for a short while, until some backup system kicks in. In this configuration, the aircraft's pitch can only be controlled via the trim wheel. Turning this wheel moves the entire horizontal tailplane, but only very slowly. In the case of smart links, the message remained there and the aircraft quickly climbed to an altitude of 1600 feet. The captain attempted to stop the climb by reducing the plane's thrust and started trimming the plane nose down. He turned the trim wheel, which then actuated the entire tailplane of the A320. Flying like this is never trained in simulators as it is considered to be insanely remote to ever happen. Initially, the captain overcorrected and sent the plane into a dive at 7200 feet per minute. That is higher than during an emergency descent. The plane quickly pitched down to 25 degrees and headed towards the ground, until the captain was finally able to arrest the descent at just 600 feet. Now he climbed again and was able to stabilize the plane somewhat, and flight now happened in an oscillating manner. Mayday was declared and the pilots flew a wide turn to return to runway 26. After 1 minute and 40 seconds of being on fire, the right engine failed. 20 seconds later, the left engine failed as well. Its oil pipes had been crushed during the impact with the ground. Meanwhile, the safety pilot had assumed the role of the co-pilot. He assisted the captain in guiding the plane back towards the runway. The captain performed a glide and touched the plane down half a minute later. It struck the ground hard, 150 meters short of the runway. All tires blew, but the aircraft's hull remained intact. The A320 hurtled down the runway but soon exited it, coming to the rest on the left bank of it. Everyone evacuated the aircraft with minor injuries and lived to tell this amazing tale. Now let's find out how this strange event could have happened. I was amazed when I saw the unlucky sequence of events. First, let's look at the flight control architecture of the A320. Pitch of the aircraft is primarily controlled by two elevator and aileron computers, the ELACs. Should ELAC 1 fail, ELAC 2 takes over. However, there are also three spoiler and elevator control computers, called the SECs. These are installed as a secondary pitch backup only, and only SEC 1 and 2 can assume pitch functions. So the failure cascade looks like this. Should ELAC 1 fail, ELAC 2 takes over. Should ELAC 2 fail, control goes to SEC 1, and if that fails, SEC 2 takes control. If all computers were to fail, pitch control is only possible by using the trim wheel. This trim wheel is mechanically connected to the tail. If this happens, the elevators lock in neutral position and the entire tailplane can be used to control pitch. This is highly unlikely. Next, let's look at the procedures used during touch and goes. This maneuver is rare during normal daily operation, but it is regularly practiced during base trainings. Therefore, Airbus provides guidance on how to do it. In 2018, the manuals contained the following instruction. After touchdown, the plane automatically trims the plane so it becomes nose heavy, thus enhancing brake efficiency since more weight is put on the ground. This is not desirable for touch and goes, so the instructor should stop the trim movement by hand when the wheel passes the zero position. This enables the plane to be balanced on the next takeoff that follows seconds after. The captain did exactly that. But every time he grabbed the trim wheel, a fault message was generated by the ELAC in control of the horizontal stabilizer. Normally, this should not happen. As it is Airbus' philosophy not to show all failure message during takeoff roll in order not to disturb the pilots during this critical phase, this message about the failure of one of four pitch control computers that would under normal circumstances not have been too important, was held back and only presented to the pilots when they passed an altitude of 1500 feet. This made it difficult for the pilots to make a connection between the pitch wheel stopping by the captain and the error. Every time the warning appeared, the computer was reset and the warning cleared. But when the fourth student was on his second flight, something strange happened. ELAC 1 had failed during touch and go, but none of the pilots recognized the fault. When the plane touched down again thereafter, the other ELAC tried to take over, but failed as well when the captain grabbed the trim wheel. Now none of the ELACs were in control, and elevator control was delegated to SEC 1 by the flight control logic. 
But just at that very moment, the plane bounced just slightly, lifting the left strut of the landing gear only inches off the runway before it touched down again a second later. Exactly during that time, the SECs tried to determine whether the plane was on the ground or in the air. One of the SECs determined, we are in the air. The other determined, we are on the ground. Realizing this disagreement, both SECs agreed to disagree and told the flight control system that they could not take over. Now, ELAC 1 and 2 had failed and SEC 1 and 2 were in disagreement, so none of the four pitch control computers could take control and the A320 reverted to the last mode it knows, manual pitch trim only. An extremely unlucky sequence of events. But why did the ELACs fail in the first place? A single ELAC failure is rare, a double ELAC failure is almost unheard of. To determine the reason, the team of investigators closely reenacted the actions of the pilots and inspected all parts involved. They eventually found that the override mechanism of the pitch trim wheel did not work properly. Normally, when the captain grabs the pitch trim wheel during the ground roll phase of the touch and go, the sensors of the tailplane realize that the pilot is trying to override the automatic commands and stop the motors controlled by the ELAC. However, the investigation found that the wrong type of oil was used in the clutch of the disconnection mechanism. The oil used was almost twice as thick as the oil that should have been used. So, every time the captain tried to override the pitch trim wheel, the clutch only disengaged partially and the sensors did not sense that the pilot wanted to take over. Further commands for tailplane movement were sent to the motors, but the tailplane could not move since the captain held the wheel firmly in his hand, as the standard procedure dictates. Now, the ELAC sensed the disagreement between the commander tailplane position and the actual position, determined something was wrong and shut themselves off one after the other. You see, this is another incident where an extremely unlucky sequence of events led to an aircraft accident. In the final report, the team of investigators recommended a series of improvements that should help avoid such an accident happening again. For example, the trim wheel should no longer be held during touch and go. Airbus also amended its procedures, now disallowing multiple flight computer resets in flight. Also, every touch and go must be considered as a single flight now and flights with certain ELAC faults are prohibited. Furthermore, they improved the control logic of sensing whether the aircraft is on ground or not, so the odds deactivation of both SECs should not happen again. In the end, the cause of the accident was attributed to three things. The use of a wrong type of oil in the horizontal stabilizer trim override assembly, the design flaw in the SEC logic that made them disagree during the short bounce, and the captain's decision to continue flight training despite numerous reoccurring warnings. However, the committee also noted that no clear guidelines existed whether he should have discontinued the training or not. Fortunately, the pilots walked away from this incident. The plane, however, did not. It was severely damaged and was written off. It could not be determined who put the wrong type of oil into the horizontal stabilizer motor clutch. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked this week's video. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. See you next week.